Hey, everybody, welcome to Scene to Screen, a show about the basics of screenwriting. Each week, I gather a diverse panel of TV staff writers, showrunners, screenwriters, and producers currently working in the industry. We discuss the skills and craft of screenwriting while making sure that the conversation stays inclusive. So if you're a new writer, this show is for you. If you're a person with a disability or of color or LGBTQ, this show is for you. Or if you're a long hair, heavy metal hippie like me, this show is for you. As always, next to me by my side is the silent lady with the fingers that spit faster than Slim Shady, our ASL interpreter, Mona Jean. Hi, Mona Jean, how you doing today? Right on. As always, our show has no sponsor, but I make one up. And this week, the sponsor is Time Management. Time Management, consider it, because I didn't. And uh, I don't have any printout or anything to show as a sponsor this week. Huh. I don't know where the time goes in quarantine, but somehow today, I lost a lot of it. Anyway, enough about that. It's time to bring on the panel. All right, first up is going to be Giselle Legere. Come on in the room, Gis. Hi. Uh, very excited. How are you doing, Giselle? I'm, I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. So the way that we do this is I give 60 seconds for each one of our panelists to describe themselves. You can tell us what your favorite food is. You can tell us where you went to school. You can tell us what you do for work, whatever you want. But this is our 60 seconds to give you so the audience can get to know you. Are you ready? Ready. All right. And away we go. Hey, uh, I'm Tessal Legere. I'm a drama writer. I'm from Miami, uh, from a family of Cuban immigrants. Um, in childhood, I lost most of my hearing to a vaccine. Um, and that had some challenges. But also, um, it had a silver lining, which is that it really developed my observational skills. That helped me as I moved through a couple of careers uh, as a ballerina, then as a judo fighter on my college judo team, and eventually as a scientist, as an epidemiologist. Um, I spent a decade working in biodefense uh, before I realized that I had a lot of stories I wanted to tell. So I started writing. Um, I got into the Sundance Lab, then the Disney ABC program, and most recently I was staffed on Quantico. And I still got nice. told. Nice. Look at that. Well done. Giselle, thanks for being here. All right. Next up is Nick Novicki. Where are you at, Nick? I'm here. Right on, right on. All I'm right, buddy. Magic. I want you. <laughs> you have 60 seconds. Tell us about Nick Novicki and go. Hey, I'm Nick Novicki. I'm an actor, comedian, writer, and producer. Um, I learned pretty early in my career that I was going to have to be in charge of writing and creating content for myself because ultimately I'm three foot ten and I wanted to play the kind of roles I wanted to play. And that's kind of worked out for me to some extent. I've acted in a lot of TV shows and movies been on Boardwalk Empire, The Sopranos, The Good Doctor, Drop Dead Diva. Uh, but a lot of it's been producing and creating my own content. And ultimately, I wanted to do that for other people with disabilities because we are the largest minority population. So I created the Disability Film Challenge, which is a weekend film competition that helps people with disabilities get involved in entertainment. I partnered with Easter Seals. It's now the Easter Seals Southern California. Uh, Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. I had a little thing over there. I got three seconds and so, uh, hey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right on, thanks, Nick. Oh, wait a minute, stop that. All right, next person up is Elaine Lowe. Hi, Elaine. Hello. You ready to tell us who you are in 60 seconds? We'll see. All right, on your mark, get set. Hi everyone, my name is Elaine Lowe. Um, what can I tell you about myself? I was born in Singapore, grew up in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the exotic Massachusetts. Um, I went to Brown University and studied psychology and math and had no plans to go into the entertainment industry. Somehow I ended up moving to Los Angeles to be an actor though, and that's what I did for quite some time. I um, Worked enough to stay here, but not enough to be fully satisfied. And that's when I started writing. 
um, first selfishly for myself, just to like create roles for myself. And then I realized I really liked writing for other people too and became, you know, decided to pursue writing full time. So I was lucky enough to get into the HBO Writers Program and sign with a great agency, Paradigm, and then get staffed on Gossip Girl, which will be on HBO Max uh, sometime in the near future, hopefully. All right, that's my time. Awesome, thanks, Elaine. All right, and last but not least, please welcome John Hartman into the room. Hey, Hi. John. How you doing today? Doing great. Right on, right on. All right, well, tell us who you are in 60 seconds or less. Ready, set, go. Um, well, let's see. Um, I uh, grew up in Virginia, but I spent uh, the early part of my career uh, in Chicago. It's really where I came up. Um, I was uh, I come from a sketch and an improv background, and I worked at the Second City there for uh, a number of years. I was on the main, I toured for about two and a half years. And then I was on the main stage for uh, about two and a half, three years as well. Um, let's see, I, uh, and then I moved to LA right after that. Um, I, uh, I was born also, by the way, I should have led, I was born with two fingers on my left hand. Um, and, but I started acting right when I was like about 13. Um, moved to LA as an actor writer. I wrote and performed at Second City as well. Um, as an actor writer out here i've done shows like the good place young sheldon curb your enthusiasm and uh i also am still writing sketch comedy and uh just finished a feature film that just got made and is edited now one second over nice that's all good <laughs> awesome well thank you guys all for being here and uh i'm going to give a little introduction about what we're going to be talking about today and then let's just get right into it all right so this week, I have done something special with this panel. Not only found some fantastic writers for you guys, but every one of them is also an established actor. I wanted to do that because we're gonna be talking about character. If you don't have engaging characters on the page, uh, our panel today will be the first ones to tell you there's not much an actor can do uh, to make them better, to make you know bad writing better. So good acting comes from good writing and great acting comes from great writing. So let's get into it with our panel and discuss the ins and outs, the internal and the external elements of character development. All right, that's my nice little intro that I botched, but ah, forget about it. Um, let's start off, I wanna just kind of define what uh, characteristics are, are necessary for, oh, my timer's still going. Uh, what are, are necessary for creating a good character and how we do that. So uh, Giselle, um, when creating characters, what sort of things do you consider? Um, do you plot these things out as part of a backstory during the outlining process? Do you map the characters or do you just let the characters come from within and discover their purpose as you travel through your screenplay? You know, everybody's process is different. But for me, um, I would say a little bit of all the above, everything you mentioned. But the thing that I do most, or the thing that I go to first is, I like to define what the character's central conflict is. What is the thing that they wrestle with and um, not just in relation to the plot, the story, but what is the thing that gets in their way um, throughout their life, but the thing that they're constantly um, trying to overcome. And that's usually the first question I answer for myself. Um, and that helps me to be able to um, figure out what kind of obstacles I'm going to set up for them um, in the plot. Can you, can you define that? Uh, I mean, you, you, you sort of talked about it, but I think when people think about story overall, like the story that their movie or their television show is going to be, um, I think sometimes the, that central conflict can be what people tend to write about first rather than the conflict being a character trait that is part of a bigger journey that they're on. How do you separate that conflict from the, from the overall journey that the character is gonna take? I think, I think part of it depends on what kind of story you're writing. Um, it's very different when you're write, uh, writing a thriller, which is more um, plot driven than if you're writing something that's very character driven. So that's gonna determine some of that. Um, 
And I think for me, it's just more interesting um, to understand um, why that character is constantly getting in their own way, because I think everybody does that. We get in our own way. Um, and that, I guess I'm not explaining it very well, but that's, that's my process. I got it. Does do, do any of anybody else on our panel, do you guys have a different uh, take on how you set up your character, your character characteristics before you get into a screenplay? Uh, I mean, a lot of time, you know, I, I like to kind of picture myself as that character, you know, that that's a lot of times when I'm when I'm writing, I, I like to kind of, I find myself acting out the, you know, how would this guy, what would this guy or girl like try to almost act out where they're going. And then usually like I, you know, what's their main problem? Like, what are they up against is like a lot of times how I like to try to write, to, you know, to, to figure out like, because a lot of times I, I have a comedy that comes into it, or it's like a the hero's journey. And so it's like, again, like, what is it? What, what are they fighting against? You know, and, and a lot of that's how I, how I like to kind of look at my characters. Okay. And, and comedy, really. Yeah. Well, what, one of the things that we can do to sort of simplify uh, character and character traits is there's there's some some are cheats and some are just necessary because it speeds the story along, which is if you use tropes. Some tropes are very uh, overused and some are fantastic for efficiency. John, could you talk about that and how you use them in the writing that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's... It, it's interesting you mentioned like things that are overused or um, maybe are what I would consider, some people don't seem to understand maybe the difference between what a trope uh, that maybe has existed for a long time because it's helpful and a quirk for a character, right? Which um, in a lot of early uh, writing for people, myself included, you may give characters a ton of interesting like quirky details but they might only be like surface level and they might not really, they may serve you for a scene or two, but they may not help you throughout the process of a whole screenplay or something like that, because they don't, they don't drive the character in any way. They're, they're merely somebody that chews with their mouth open or they sing the same song all the time, you know, like something like that. Um, that being said, so trope sometimes sounds like a dirty word, but I find it also can get you to the heart of a character very quickly. Um, and because I came from a sketch background, sometimes you want to get to that character, just like you want to find out what this person is, who they are. And then if the audience knows what they think this character is, any sort of development beyond that main thing is going to be a very welcome surprise. Um, so, um, you know, the person that you see is like, uh, say you have a really like uh, happy mailman in your script who always says hello to you when you drops off the mail. Okay, we've seen this trope a lot before. Maybe um, even we enjoy some parts of it. Well, the minute we, um, we've nailed that thing and then later on we can maybe discover something about this guy that he uh, he's lives a solitary life and he goes home and he sits in the dark for an hour um, when he gets home off his shift. Okay, so now that's that trope is actually something that helped us make something more uh, unique or different about this character now. Um, the other thing I'll say about tropes that has actually helped me in, in my work currently, um, I recently, I mentioned this earlier that I finished a film that just was shot in Vancouver and it just wrapped and it luckily before all this happened so it, it's being edited right now I mostly work in comedy um, but I was approached to write a rom-com for I don't know where it's going yet but for like Hallmark uh, Lifetime or Netflix um, it hasn't been it's in the process of being sold to one of those places right now through a production company um, but I was approached about it because those places, particularly Hallmark and Lifetime, have a lot of success with people writing those movies because with comedians, because comedians know genre tropes really well. So uh, I had never written anything like that before, but found it really fun and a fun assignment to do almost because 
yeah, I, I've worked with stock characters for so long and, and know how to divert from them as well. So um, that was such a great challenge to lean into what is good about a trope or a stock kind of character that we know that's a tradition and uh, what's a good way to subvert that too. Well, I'd imagine in comedy as well, what's great about leaning into a trope is that at some point for a punchline, you can turn it on its head and, and do, do the opposite of what you expect. And then you get a nice reaction from your audience because everybody's expecting the red shirt in Star Trek to die. And then when he's the last one left alive, everyone's like, oh, what? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, they, they're in, in sketches, there's in, in like rudimentary sketch, they teach you about a premise and then you have a turn and then you maybe even have a second turn in that scene. And um, it's so true that you have to subvert audience expectations because everything has been done. So the audience, you don't want them to feel like they're one or two steps ahead of you in any way. Um, I feel like re in recent years, like Key and Peele were so good with that. Um, mm. where, and they talk about that often about when they write stuff that uh, they know that the audience is already is kind of going with them and thinks they know where they're going. So they never wanted you to get bored with a sketch halfway through when you think you know where it's going. It has to, it has to be, uh, there has to be a misdirect. There has to be something new in there. And I have to imagine that that helps with particularly Jordan Peele with when he went into a completely different genre and started doing features. Totally, totally. yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, well, I was gonna say one of the only other things that has as, as many uh, sort of tropes as, as comedy can would be horror, but then there's also rom-com. I guess every genre has its own set of tropes, but um, let's not get into genre, let's stay on characters. So um, one of the ways that, uh, that, you know, characters keep things engaged and keep things going on is that uh, they have to have the stakes raised around them or, or they raise the stakes for themselves. So Elaine, could you talk a little bit about what it means, like what are stakes? What, what does it mean to raise the stakes? Um, and, and how are some ways that that's typically done in a story? Sure, so raising the stakes is probably one of the most common notes that anyone will ever give you, both as a writer and as an actor, like, oh, it's all right, but you gotta raise the stakes. And you're like, oh, well, but, um, <laughs> but what, it, what that note means is that the, the emotional core of what the character is going through is not heightened enough to actually be interesting. <laughs> At least that's how I take it, you know? That, um, so stakes are what is most important to the character. And I mentioned emotional core because I think sometimes we get confused with stakes of like, oh, there's explosions or there's like a monster chasing you or that type of stuff. But those aren't stakes. Those are just really the situation. To me, the stakes are like, how does the character feel about this? Why is it so important? And I have um, I have a writing group. Like I like to write big, mostly like big plotty, twisty things. And I have a friend in the writing group who writes like very small stories. Like she wrote a thing, I won't give any details, but it was about like two nuns on the street, you know? And you're like, what stakes are there with two nuns on a street? And And you know, plenty <laughs> because things were important to them about what they were fighting about and what they were fighting for you know and so um I think stakes are probably the most important thing and Giselle referred to this at the very beginning when she said like the first thing I do is try to figure out like what are they fighting like what's the obstacle you know and if the obstacle isn't big enough then the stakes aren't high enough yeah so um I, one of the easiest examples of stakes is, is like life or death. And it's so funny that, you know, if you're doing a rom-com and, and you need to raise the stakes, you're like, well, what am I going to do? Say if the guy doesn't fall in love with the girl, he's going to die. Like if everything, if everything was life or death, it's, it's exhausting. It's like living in quarantine. Um, but so I guess, and there, I, I know it, it, this, this question is going uh, it, to, it's a, it's a bigger question that could probably be, it, be its own conversation, but, um, you know, besides raising the stakes for life or death, 
Um, how are how are ways that you look at generating those things within within your characters? What are what are other things that people can consider could mean a lot internally to a character that would give them more purchase, more value? Um, because I know a large portion of this audience is uh, it might have a disability, and if they do, they would think like, well, you know. I have high stakes because yes, I can live in a life or death situation every day. Or, you know, when I go outside, I'm risking my life or, or whatever it is, but it's not always, it's not always life or death, you know, and we still need to keep the story moving when people are just having a cup of coffee inside their house or going to work. Um, if there's not some sort of constant engine it, uh, driving it, how, how do, where can people look to kind of discover these threads that stitch together stronger character development? So I thought I had on that, I'm oh, sorry, Elaine. Go for it. Um, the first thing that came to mind when that you were saying that was, um, I was thinking about the movie Eighth Grade and Bo Burnham talking about the, uh, the pool party scene in that and that he wanted it. And if you haven't seen it, um, it's when this, the main character goes to, um, uh, yes, highly recommended, um, goes to a, a pool party and she's in a bathing suit for the first time in front of these girls at a very awkward stage of her life. And he's like, I wanted that scene to have life or death stakes in the, in the DNA of it. And it should feel like a war scene, basically. Oh, as, as intense uh, emotionally as a battle scene. And you do feel it. So you go, okay, why is this scene so intense? The stakes, they literally couldn't be higher for this girl. And it's because they're fueled by emotion. So that's where you, I think you can find a character either has something going on or not enough going on because these, the most primal and guttural emotions can make anything life or death. Embarrassment, um, rage, uh, lust, uh, these like the, the, the really primal ones that fuel us in everyday life can be life or death in a moment because of the way the emotion hits you. Cool. Elaine, were you going to add something? Yeah, I was going to say, so sometimes I would write first and then think after which is like a very bad plan for writing. And um, I, I have a lot of people who are more experienced, who I consider mentors to me, who would read my writing and then go like, okay, but what does this character want? Like, what does she, what does the lead character want? And I'm like, well, she doesn't want this thing. And they're like, that's not answering the question. A doesn't want something to happen does not allow the character to actually try to get something. Um, and so I think that is one specific thing that I know if I can't answer that question with a, she wants to blank, then the stakes aren't high enough because I don't know what the character wants. How can anyone watching possibly know or anyone reading possibly know? So that was one thing that I realized I had to kind of reconfigure because writing to me, I, I think it's so fun. And so what one of my mentors told me was that writing is the reward for all the hard work that goes in first of thinking about character, thinking about stakes, like putting it all together, figuring, figuring all that stuff out first, for probably for a long time and a hard time. And then you get to write once you figured it all out. And that's like the fun part. But very often I would just be like, here we go, writing, you know? And then I'd have to sometimes, I'm, for many scripts that I did, I had to do a page one rewrite from the beginning because my characters weren't clear and what they wanted wasn't clear. The stakes weren't high enough, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, I know from my experience, one of the things that I'll, I'll sometimes do that too, which is I call it like the vomit draft, where I just like, rah, I get it out there. And then I look at the piece, then that's where I can find the pieces. Like, what are the characters? Oh, I can get rid of that character, or I can combine these characters. And, and the story needs to be more interesting in this way, or there needs to be more conflict or, or whatever. Um, Nick, it sounded like you were going to add something to that. Yeah, I would say too, with, you know, in, in terms of raising the stakes, because you also want to, you know, really make sure that it's true. These are, you know, the, 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 that it feels true to your character. 
And I think, you know, that, that example of eighth grade is really, you know, taking such an embarrassing, rough moment that almost like if you can, the more that you're, you have these stories, uh, you know, for writers with disabilities, you know, I, the more crazy stories you have that you could put in and, and you know those stakes or you know firsthand from somebody else, that you can tie these stories in and the stakes are coming from a true place and really heightened. I think that that's a tool that really kind of separates you, especially when, when people are reading your samples or just for your script in general. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I, a comedian who's one of the biggest comedians that literally is like, I go out of my way to, uh, you know, literally does the stadiums. He, he tries to get in awkward situations. So he's, <laughs> actively looking to get into like I want to be on a bus ride that I'm going to hate so I can write about that you know like that's the <laughs> yeah, I mean that sounds like a great work ethic but man that sounds miserable <laughs> <laughs> John John I'm so happy that you did bring up eighth grade I, I haven't thought about that movie in a minute and uh and you're right that is a fantastic example because I remember seeing that and feeling like a 12 year old girl and just being like, oh my God, like I was so engaged. I was so with her on that journey at that pool party. And that's that's a fantastic example. I would also say for people that are trying to write characters, if you need uh, more inspiration on, on how to raise the stakes, we have you turn to yourself and it has to be something that is heightened, whether it's something that sparked an emotion in you or, or made you upset or made you extremely happy or whatever, because in there is the thread, is the spark, is the seed that maybe your character needs to experience. You, I mean, there's nothing more boring than just vanilla characters that we're supposed to feel for. Uh, this is a medium, this television and film and theater where we want to feel, we're giving you our emotions. But if you're not giving us something to feel like, oh, I think you, you lose your audience like that. Um, let's see, I wanted to go back uh, to uh, so, sort of a structure of, of character. And, and this is something that takes place from beginning to end. Uh, there's a bunch of different theories on how this can be done, but basically yeah, the, the most common one to discuss is the hero's journey. Uh, Giselle, could you tell us a little bit, like, tell us what the hero's journey is and maybe how that is structurally applied within any given story or screenplay? Right. So the hero's journey is familiar to a lot of writers. It's, um, you have this whole set of steps, which I think the first one is, um, there's a call, right? There's a call to action. Um, and jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they call to action and the hero rejects that, you know, they're comfortable in their own world and um, they don't want to uh, move out. And then something happens and they have to make that choice. And this is uh, where they usually face a dilemma. And the, the key point of um, when we're talking about stakes and obstacles and if you set it up right, um, this dilemma should be a really hard choice. Uh, to make that's what makes it interesting. Um, that's all I remember about the hero series. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this: in, in your experience, so you you wrote an episode of Quantico. When yes. you go into something that's like an episodic of television, um, the, you, a lot of times you're handed your characters. Maybe there's a character or two that are created that is going to be the antagonist for that episode, or or the major obstacle that your established characters have to get over. But are you considering the fundamentals of, of things like the hero's journey? Like, do you, like, does your showrunner just say, look at the beginning of the episode, she needs to be here. And at the end of the episode, she needs to be there because it's, it's, that, it's that space between where we're invested that makes it interesting. Right, and so you definitely wanna have a character arc. And there's a lot of ways to get to that, some people use Hero's Journey or Save the Cat or um, any half dozen uh, methods to get there. But um, in the room, we uh, we focused on, well, we were on a plot driven show. So a little less character, um, but you did always want the character to learn something 
or to have uh, changed in some way by the end of the, the episode. And I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, it, it does. I mean, there needs to be growth. There needs to be growth, exactly. Yeah, a character that's the same at the end of the movie as they were in the beginning is like, ugh. Right, know. a static is born. Yeah, even Billy Madison learned how to do math. <laughs> sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank God he had a good looking teacher. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, let's, uh, I, I wanna get more into the actor space now and sort of talk, talking about now, cause not only are you guys really good uh, on the page, but you also have to take pages, not just ones that you write or maybe for characters that you've written for yourselves or, or whatever, but when you're hired as, as talent on a, a large production, you're having to embody somebody else's words. So um, like, a, as we transition into that, John, I'd, I'd like to know, Having, being of two worlds, being an actor and a writer, um, do you find, especially if you're reading other things that you're just cast in something, do you personally write differently as an actor? Or is it a, is it a, is it straight, a straight ahead skill? Um, I think, yes. And there, I, I think I write a little differently as an actor um, because actors have all sorts of, Piccadillos about what they want and don't want to see in a script. Um, we had talked briefly about this before about parentheticals in a script and whether that's a good thing or not. Um, I, an overuse of parentheticals, I think is a, can be bad for a script for sure. And it's something a lot of writers do early on. But what that does um, to an actor is saying, I don't trust you to make the choice here. So I'm going to tell you what the choice is, how, how to play this. And so the, I feel like there should be used so sparingly. Um, do, again, do me a favor really quick, just in case people don't know, define what a parenthetical is in case they don't know the structure of it. Yes. Um, a parenthetical is in a, a line of dialogue right under the character name. Sometimes um, there might be a short description um, it's usually an adverb uh, that will say um, in parenthetical, uh, a parentheses, um, an emotion sort of to play. Uh, these are sort of famously used to be called Rileys, W-R-Y-L-Y, because um, screenwriters would, were at one point, I don't remember who um, called them this, but we're overusing Riley as a parenthetical that they were just calling them Riley's after a while because it's like telling your character you have to smirk when you're saying it uh, or something. Anyway, it's just, it was ridiculous. It was not necessary. Um, that being said, so an, an actor doesn't want to see every time a line comes up that it says Riley, um, snarkily, uh, emotionally, uh, the ones where it's so on the nose. Um, that being said, I've heard people like uh, Greta Gerwig um, for Little Women, and she's an actor turned uh, director, writer, has a lot of fun with her parentheticals. She puts in really interesting ways that might be more of clues of how to play uh, things rather than the on the nose um, description that I was referring to before. Anyway, long way of saying when I write now, I, I take these things into consideration because I know what can seem like way too much for an actor. Um, there's a kind of unspoken rule on a set that you don't give an actor a line reading, um, even if you know exactly how you want a line done, that it's insulting to the actor um, and that, that you've hired the actor to do their job so that once the hiring is done, the actor comes with the choices that they come with. Um, so you have to, as a writer, convey those things with a way that doesn't get in the way of the actor doing their job, but also is clear enough if you have a vision for it, which you should as a writer, um, to put that in um, the scene description and the back story or any character character description that you've put in before. All right. 
So, so parentheticals are a bad thing. Um, <laughs> not always. But uh, Nick, I'm curious to know, is as an actor, is there anything that you wish there was more of on the page? You know, uh, unless it's more lines for me, you know, as an actor. <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, not really. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, it's different. When you're a, like a guest star, a lot of times, or, you know, if you're starting out as an actor, you're not, you know, you're there to service the, uh, the, the series regulars on the TV show or in some senses. So sometimes you're like, you're just getting it. You don't know everything. There's a new draft and you're like, who is this character? So sometimes it, it would almost be helpful for you to have like a little bit more of an idea of who people are, like breakdowns almost, or kind of, you know, backstory. But, you know, I, there's the other side of it that's just fun to have your own interpretation of it. Um, and, you know, I think that you, you wanna just be there, you know, I, let the actors to an extent figure out the scene. And I think sometimes you're going to see something different or unique. Um, I wrote for the CBS uh, Diversity Showcase um, a couple years ago, and that was really the first time that I was writing not for myself, uh, but for other people and a lot of other people. And I found like the less kind of description I, get, I gave, it was kind of interesting that people would just kind of, you know, do something that was, you know, bringing it in a different direction that sometimes was honestly better than what I uh, envisioned and other times where I'm like, ah, I should have described more, you know, I hate that, you know, but yeah, that's kind of part of it, I think. Yeah. Elaine, so Nick said something about backstory. And I know I, sometimes when I write, I'll, I'll try to do that for characters. But I also know, or I've heard that that's something that actors like to do. If it's a bigger role, or if it's in a feature film where, you know, they want to sit and write their backstory so they can be in touch with their character. Have you, have you, experience with that on, on both sides of the, the camera? Is there one you prefer more than other? Or? I think it really depends on the project, the role, the actor that you are, right? So for example, um, I had an acting teacher who was really amazing. And he, you know, if you had a guest star or co-star audition, he's like, don't be sitting there like writing your backstory for two pages that's ridiculous like you're just there to service what is here on the page and then you're gone you know um so you don't need to do all that stuff and in fact like you're making too much of a meal of it that it, it's it's off-putting even if you're doing uh, a role in such a strange way based on this backstory that you just made up you know and i i think that's true on the flip side of that though you do need to make something up probably so that you can feel emotionally connected and not just be a parrot reciting lines, you know? Um, you do need to feel something. So I say if, if, if backstory helps you to make a truer character choice as an actor, then by all means do it. But if you're going into an audition and talking to the writer and being like, so what's the backstory? This is what I came up with. <laughs> like, that's one way to not get a job, right? You know. <laughs> So, um, so it really depends on, on, like I said, what the role is, also what the project is. I mean, I think, for example, TV is like, you, you see 22 episodes of a show over the season, like, you know what that show is, go in and service that show. And you probably don't need to make too much up. Um, whereas maybe you're auditioning for an indie film and it's, maybe it's a first time filmmaker who really wants to explore with the actor and like create, you know, so, so it really does depend on, on what it is that you're doing. And also whether or not you got the job too, I think. <laughs> it's one thing to audition and it's another thing to book a role and then have that freedom to really collaborate more with the, the director or whoever is in, in charge of, you know, working with you. Yeah, yeah. Giselle, do you have anything to add about backstory? Um, I think that, as you were saying, it's important to have some. You don't want to come up with this super complicated thing and just kind of make a character bigger than, than what the writer and the director intend. Um, I've seen that happen on set, and uh, it's not pretty. Uh, so... You know, 
come up with a backstory, but also be aware of, um, you know, the importance of that character within the bigger storyline. Okay, cool. Um, one last thing before we get into uh, some of our audience questions on YouTube. By the way, if you guys are watching on YouTube and you want to ask any of our fantastic panel questions, feel free to type it into the, I'm pointing over here because this is the screen I have it on. Uh, type it into the chat box and I will ask them uh, whatever you want about screenwriting. Um, no, Elaine's not gonna tell you about Gossip Girl. So uh, don't ask anything about that and no spoilers about anything else. But if you are interested in screenwriting, send us your questions and I'll ask. Um, so we've got a fantastically diverse group of people on this panel. And I'm curious to know if you have ever found yourself in a situation where the written word on the page uh, could not necessarily be achieved uh, by you being cast in a situation. And I, I have a little, I'll, I'll tell the story as quickly as I can. Uh, I met Nick on a film that I directed called Unlikely Temptations, where he played the devil. And uh, his name was Bob, short for Beelzebub. And, uh, and we went out to the desert in California and it was, it was fantastic. It was a beautiful location, Dumont Dunes. And there's these huge sand dunes. And, uh, and I turned to Nick and I said, hey, okay, so we're gonna climb up this big dune and you're gonna go up there and you're gonna start talking to Jesus about this thing. And Nick goes, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not climbing up that thing, man. Do you see the size of my legs? Are you crazy? And I hadn't even thought of it. Together, Nick and I had read through the script several times. We had rehearsed with the actors. We were good to go. And it was one of those things that not until we got to the location did we see like this. In, fair, in, in this fairness, is a ridiculous though, request. In fairness, I thought we were going to be CGIing a giant sand dune. <laughs> I didn't realize we were going to be like, oh, yeah, let's just go up to the moon over here. Nick, I, I told you the budget in advance. The best CGI I could have done was maybe like yeah, cut out a little piece of paper in the background. But that's, uh, that's another but thing anyway, though. Most actors, we just take everything. We're like, yeah, I can do that, <laughs> sure, yeah. So what you're saying is it wasn't necessarily my fault, it was your fault. Probably. <laughs> well, I'm curious to know if you guys have any stories like that where, you, where you, you got into a job or you wrote something and then things had to be changed at the last minute or along the way because things weren't necessarily thought out or presented in the, in the best way possible. Um, I I probably have a few stories, but um, I got to write for Molly Matlin on um, Quantico, and we we learned a lot as we went. Even though I'm deaf and she's deaf, um, we had to figure things out. And one of the things was um, like sight lines. Just when um, she was talking and other people were talking for her to uh, read lips, um, we had to make sure that everybody was you know, in, in, within her eyesight. Um, and so that meant often rearranging the set, rearranging where people were, were um, standing, you know, rehearsing block and all these things. But it was something that we all learned as we went along. But um, probably other people have better, more interesting stories. Yeah, no, that's good. That makes a lot of sense. Who else? I had an, an um, this is the sort of interesting thing I thought of when you were saying that. Um, I was hired on the show, I did a guest spot on the show, Superior Donuts, um, it was on CBS when that was on. And a friend of mine wrote on the show and she recommended me for this part. I went and auditioned, but she recommended me. And she's like, I think you'd be good for this part that's in this episode. So um, I went in and read for it. Um, and also sideline, because this story doesn't have to do with my, um, hand, but I'm also gay. I'm part of that LGBT community. And she, this writer, she knew that. And the part was for a gay, like hipster character. And another note, like I almost never get cast in gay parts um, sometimes, but for whatever reason, um, there's, there's sometimes they're lo are looking for something much different. I don't know. Anyway, this part was written as gay. I went in I, I got the part, um, we got to, we did the table read and we finally, we got on set and we, uh, it's a three camera sitcom that's shot in front of a live audience. And all of a sudden in front of the audience, 
the lines that had to do with being gay or we're talking about that they're only alluded to they were just not going over at all they were landing with a thud and for i don't know why what it was looking like on the day um the weird thing is like i they because they can't ask someone if they're gay um to get a job um you can assume uh or you can have someone play it a certain way it's hard to ask somebody to play something gayer um i don't think you can ask somebody to do that i don't know that seems like legally you mean like you can't say like hey be more gay yeah i don't think so yeah. <laughs> yeah but i could tell they were trying to get me to do that and i also was trying but it it wasn't feeling right and um so they on the fly on the day they changed the character the sexuality stuff was gone from the script it was just a hipster um this is like during the shoot because you're shooting live um and it was interesting just to be like okay this thing is not working the way that it was um for whatever reason in front of the audience and uh be, it just was a very a very interesting scenario to to be in did your did your hipster lines go over well went great went great oh perfect nice i'm, I'm happy there's yeah. a good ending there i mean i, elaine, I feel oh i'm sorry oh i thought I, I thought elaine you had something going didn't you um yeah i have two very quick stories one is from the point of view of um safety as an actor especially at the beginning i did some you know indie stuff and probably a lot of our writers who might be watching are um, newer and like maybe making some of their own stuff. And uh, I got in some dangerous situations, you know, in terms of um, drive a car and like, uh, you know, stop on a dime with no set, you know, like it was just like a college kid standing there waiting to be like, don't drive this way to other cars, you know? And, um, and because I was new, I was willing to pretty much do anything. And now I know a little bit better than that. So, so that's what I would say to be careful of when you're making your own stuff is be aware. Like, would you want someone to tell you to do that and not be safe? You know, um, not to mention just liability. Uh, oh. I, I am, I've been a member of SAG-AFTRA for a long time and a member of the board of directors in particular. And so um, our contracts are there for a reason and to protect people. And a lot of times when people are making their own stuff, they don't want to pay for insurance. But I think it's important if you are a writer who is producing your own stuff, I think it's important to take responsibility for that and for the safety of the people who are on your set. Um, the other quick story I have though is about being an Asian woman and um, I was I was doing extra work. This is at the very beginning of my career and I was an extra on the show Entourage. And I was just like sitting in a restaurant, that type of thing. I filmed that, I'm done. I'm in the van going back to base camp and I hear one of the PAs or whoever talking on the walkie talkie or on, you know, in their ear. So I couldn't hear the other side, but they were like, oh, the dry cleaner. Oh no, he fell out. You know, like they had lost whoever was gonna play the dry cleaner. And I see him looking at me and he's like, we got one. And I was like, oh my God, they mean they got an Asian. <laughs> like that's what, that's what wow. they're saying, you know? So he looks at me and he's like, do wow. you wanna, he's like, do you wanna be in another scene? And I was like, did you, when you said we got one, did you mean an Asian? And he was like, oh, yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and look, it was all fine. I got to be in another scene. I was fine with it. But it was one of my earliest moments of just being like tight in a little box, you know? Totally. And for me, when I write, I have to tell you, like, I always thought I had the most open mind of like, anyone can do any part, but I, I did this training of um, implicit bias and realized that I too had my blind spots. Like maybe it's a, a, a differently abled person. Maybe it's uh, an age thing. You know, even for me as a woman, like I still wrote an army guy at first, not thinking like, why couldn't it be an army woman, you know, in a project? So stuff like that, like, I think it's important for anyone to explore and go, could this be a different character? Could this look a different way? Instead of just the, we started this conversation talking about tropes, like let's 
let's subvert those. And that includes casting as well. I think you, you, I mean, I almost, Nick, Nick, I'm going to give it to you one second, but I just want to say, I think Elaine, like in that conversation or that description you just had, you like nailed on the head why these conversations in this particular Q&A panel is important to me because we all have implicit bias. We all have blind spots. And whether you're, it doesn't matter uh, what your race, what your gender, what your identity, you know, we all have something to learn about that. And it's being, it's learning to be open about that. And then hopefully that will create more opportunity for everybody. And what I hope is more inclusion all, all around the board, you know? Um, so I just thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I was listening really hard to what you said and it almost, you know, I was almost like, oh my God, she gets it. <laughs> uh, anyway, Nick. Well, first off, I want to apologize because I was that dry cleaner, Elaine. So, <laughs> first off the bat, sorry. Uh, the, no, I mean, so a lot of my stuff too, like, I mean, I, I literally, I'm almost every project I've been on, I've had to like, in some senses, like, lawyer for myself as an actor or you know and then vice versa when I'm writing too like because I can't do certain things a lot of times and they don't mean it in a bad way but they're like you're just gonna ride this motorcycle or you'll just you know just jump off that thing I'm like I've learned how to walk like three times I've been in body cast I'm not doing I can't do that you know and you know I'm, I'm confident enough to like figure out like another solution or talk it out on the day and I think that uh, a lot of you know, up and coming actors or writers kind of freak out because they think that things can't get changed. And in some senses, you can almost come up with a better solution to things. Uh, and I would say definitely physically, but also for me as a little person, I've had a lot of times where people write, you know, thinking comedy all about me being a little person. And I'm able to be like, hey, what if we were to just change it a little bit like that? So it's not just like, you know, that I'm in on the joke, you know, like this is just a, just a different spin. And so I always challenge people and, and try to, you know, to do that to other people with disabilities or other, you know, if you're, if you're writing for somebody that you're not part of that group. Totally. This, uh, Nick, as far as disabilities go, and this is, a, this is actually a question that was asked a, a week ago um, by Megan, she asked, um, you know, if you want to write a character with a disability, uh, how do you research that? If you don't know somebody that has that disability per se, what, what is a good way? If someone wants, they say, I want to write um, a character, or Giselle, like any of you guys, like what, what is a good way for people to do some research and find out about things they may not know, but they know they want to include in a story? I mean, I would say just write a good character. Sorry. No, no, I, I was just going to say start with Google and then find real people to talk to. And that's, that's my advice, you know, um, start with the basics and then um, you really need insights um, into people's experiences. So don't be afraid to, to go find people, you know, we have the internet now, you can, everybody's on YouTube and Twitter and everything. So there's no excuse why you can't go have a conversation with somebody. Experience. Yeah, I, I would say the exact same thing. I mean, there, we are such a large minority population. I mean, there's everybody knows somebody with a disability. Now, if it's something very specific, specific, you know, you're looking for, you know, a little person. Now, I'm just, I don't want random people like searching for little people now out on the street where you're driving like, hey, is that a little person over there? Hey, come in. You know, like, we're not trying to do that. But no, you, you can get to know people, you know, and, and I think that's the best way. But beyond that, really, it's about if it's just, you know, write the write, write to a character and forget about the disability or the race and just write a good character and then add that in. But I would say to try to, you know, connect yourself with with whoever you're writing for. Definitely. Cool. All right. We got a question here from Stephen. Um, he says for uh, pilots, can you talk about character flaws uh, and drive, I guess, drives within storylines, um, B story plots, or or both uh, characters, character based story engines that are less prominent in episodic versus serialized stories. That's a very rich question, Stephen. Um, 
let me just review here yeah, for pilot. Yeah, for oh, I guess for pilot, like if you're if you're going to be pitching something. So the very first episode that you're hoping somebody's going to pick up. Um, what are some sec? Uh, let me try and truncate his question. What are some successful sort of plot lines or or, or uh, tropes <laughs> that uh, that are central to story that that are easy that are easily consumable for studio executives that are looking for new new projects? We're all quiet because that's a very complicated question, <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably a ton of answers as well. So I'll attempt to give one answer, which is um, I think something that can work very well is when two characters have problems that are at odds with each other, right? Because then not only does character A have a problem and a goal and character B has a problem and a goal, but it's hard to get those goals because they're fighting against each other. So that's one way that like an A storyline and a B storyline might then come to connect at some point. I hope that answers the question. Um, I think also, Corey, you, you, you switched it a little about pitching because I also think pitching is different than writing the pilot in a way because when I pitch, it tends to be much more focused on the A storyline. Um, because you only have this limited time to grab someone's attention. And I might allude to a B or C storyline, but um, not, not in any great detail. But at the same time, obviously, if I'm going to write something, it does need to, to be there and to be fleshed out. So I just want to make that clarity. Nice. No, I appreciate that. Anybody else want to add something? Any thoughts pop into your head on that? Yeah, I, um, I, I just had finished writing uh, a pilot and thinking about pitching as well. The, maybe the thing to avoid or to know in that scenario that I, I also went through, I read like almost every one of the new pilots this year, um, that many of which won't get made um, now for a number of reasons, but a lot of them wouldn't get made anyway. Um, but you see, you start to see the traps. And one I saw a lot of is the A storyline often becomes this parade of character introductions. And um, they all, and they tend to follow the same line, the, the same order of things. And it, it literally looks like a parade of, now we meet this person, we're gonna meet this person, we're gonna meet this person. And people that read a ton of pilots are gonna zone out. Um, and so there's, there's a way you can make your A storyline interesting. You don't have to introduce every single one of your characters in the pilot. Um, you, we, if it's not important to that pilot and it's not going to make that reader not read past page 10 <clears throat> or page five, um, it's having those character dynamics that you need for that story and making it as dynamic as possible in those first 10 pages. Nice. Cool. All right. We have one other question here from um, Dawn. She says, are there any characters or qualities that help to make an indie project more viable in terms of finding more of an audience or distribution later? I mean, that that goes back to like the whole IP. You know, if you have if a project based on, you know, somebody that is a real person or a book or something like that, um, that, that obviously helps in terms of like distribution or, or producing. I would say that, um, cause you said indie film. And oh. I think the, yeah. the key would be to find something that's universal. And you do that by making the project as specific as possible. And, and the specificity is that you find the universal and that's what appeals, that's what gonna help you appeal to a broad audience. So that's, that's my tip. Yeah, it's good. I also think you can um, think of, you know, the easy way out is what's popular in the market, right? Like it's much easier to sell a horror film than it is to sell a comedy, for example, or a drama. Um, so that's, I call it the easy way out because it might not be the thing you want to write, but maybe it's it's the thing that like you think could sell better. But at the end of the day, it does take so much work and effort first to write, then to try to sell something, then to make something. Like I, I say, only do the, do the 
the genre that you want to do as opposed to like just thinking about trying to sell something um because if you don't have a passion for it it will fall to the wayside yeah people will see through it the authenticity that's needed for actors to be on camera conveying their emotions also needs to be in the writing from the screenwriter it goes back to like if the writing's bad it doesn't matter how good of an actor you have you're just stuck anyway um so that's uh that's the audience questions we have that's that's that so let's start to wrap this bring this bad boy home um i've got a segment that is called the good the bad and the shameless where I've asked each one of you to give me three things. One is the good, which is uh, suggest a nice learning resource for our writers. Um, the bad, what's a common mistake that writers tend to make that uh, hopefully people watching can avoid. And the shameless, what's the fun thing that you do to take your mind off of writer's block if you're just staring at the cursor pinging at you endlessly, or if you're sick of quarantine and you just need to get out of your head, what's the shameless thing that you turn to? So how about we start with John? What's your good? My resource that I thought of, and I'm going to tie this back to stakes again, because we were talking about it before. My resource for new writers, if you want to know how to write stakes, watch musicals. Um, this is for character development because there, uh, musicals are great for character um, character drives and wants because characters sing in musicals because they, they're so emotional about the thing that they're doing that they can no longer say it and they must sing it. It's that emotional. Um, the lead characters of musicals have the biggest wants, drives you've ever seen. Um, the second, second only to like Pixar movies. Pixar movies are great for stakes and wants and drives. Um, I perform in a, well, until recently, I guess, uh, a weekly show at UCB here in LA, a, a musical improv show called Baby Wants Candy. And we watch a ton of musicals for reference, just not only for that, but they make the, for the best character wants and drives that you could imagine. Cause they're at an 11 right away. Um, so nice. they're a great resource for new writers. Okay, so what's your bad? What's a common mistake people make? My bad is um, re resist the urge to edit as you go. Um, Ooh, yeah. And I was thinking about what you said, Corey, about your vomit draft. And I feel like that's such a good uh, piece of advice because you're gonna wanna do something where you're going, you're, you're making progress and then you're gonna go back and look over what you did and then move forward as much as you can get that first draft done. It's not gonna be great. It's gonna be bad. It's, it's gonna be bad, but that's yeah. good. Um, you have, then you have it down on the page. Um, yeah. So re, yeah, resisting the urge to edit as you go. Nice, and, and what's, your, what's your shameless thing, your guilty pleasure that takes you out of your head? Well, I don't know if it's a guilty pleasure. I mean, everyone has their comfort food things for right now. My thing that gets me out of my head and I'm, I haven't been doing this since I was in college, but I'm out back, I'm back on words with friends like crazy. I'm, I'm so I'm like, I'm, I'm playing, it's an, an app that's like, it's Scrabble. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know it, but I will like get up and I, I play words with friends while in motion. So I'm walking and playing words with friends. Um, so I'm getting like the blood flowing again. And my brain is sort of, being tested, but it's also a game. So that's where I've been going to. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, John. Hey, Giselle, how about you? What's your good? What's your bad? And what's your shameless? Okay, so the good is, um, for me, I taught myself to write by reading a ton of script. So um, that for any new writer, just read a lot of script and you'll learn a ton from them. Um, you can go to, uh, there's a site, just type in TV Google, uh, TV script Google, and you'll find a bunch. And also, the BBC has a, a library of um, almost all their shows, um, and you can download them and um, you know learn a ton. Um, the bad, uh, going off what he said, uh, definitely give yourself permission to suck. You know, it, don't edit, do the vomit draft, and um, it's more important to finish than 
than to make it perfect or even good on the first time. We all suck. We all do. If we're honest, we all suck when we write the first draft. And uh, the shameless. Uh, so maybe uh, for me, the shameless is, I'm a single mom. I, I don't have time for, for uh, any fun shameless things. But um, I write at night and for the last couple of weeks, it's been really hard. I've been anxious. I've, had, I've been struggling. And uh, finally I said, um, I'm gonna quit, but I won't do that. But um, I, I just said, I, I can't, I, I can't write. And I just took like two weeks of just reading whatever I wanted, not even like IP or anything that was gonna be for just like Cosmo magazines and whatever I found. And eventually it kind of, um, it, shook, it shook something loose. Like I came up with a new idea. I started a new pilot and I'm really happy with it. So um, take a break once in a while, just do whatever it is that, um, that brings you joy. Nice. Thanks, Giselle. Nick, what about you? Tell me you're good. Tell me you're bad. Tell me you're shameless. <laughs> uh, for the good, I mean, I, I got to say, Save the Cat really helped me in a big way. Um, you know, got me through for structure. And I look, I like, I like knowing where I, the things I'm supposed to have, you know, I, you know, I wrote two screenplays and um, literally that, that helped me keep me on track to like figure out where all right, where am I going? Where's the, where's the end? Where am I, you know? So some of those things I think is incredibly helpful. Uh, I would say for the bad, uh, you know, I, I, I think sometimes when people write, they're so precious with their words and, you know, this is, this goes honestly into TV, you know, you're not just for when people are, sometimes you'll see these giant chunks, like monologue chunks, and I think sometimes it's like it, there's just too much exposition or too much things that you want to get in there. And as a writer, you're like, but this is so good and it's great. But I think you need to almost read yourself out loud or try to think like, would you, would you hear somebody else talk this way? Is it like, is this not conversational enough? Because that's really what, you know, you want to be, you want things to feel real. So I think that, you know, really, you know, help your actors out, but also help yourself, you know, to, to make it so that it's like, this is something fluid. The teleplay is going to be something you would normally say or someone else. Um, and for the cool. uh, the shameless, I like to box. I find myself, I need to stand up and kind of like shadow box a little bit. Cause I'll, you know, I sit here and I get sore easy and stuff. And so sometimes I need to just like, just, you know. Move the bod, man. You got to move yeah. the bod. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Elaine, take us home. What's your good? What's your bad? What's your shameless? Okay, for my good, I reach to my books that sit next to me all the time. Um, and I'm sorry, there's more than one because I couldn't pick. The War of Art is fantastic. If you're feeling super blocked and you want to just like get a little kick in the butt. This is called The Hollywood Game Plan. It was um, written by Carol Kirshner, who is one of my mentors. And she also runs the CBS um, diversity writing program and also the WGA showrunners program. So I think she knows what she's talking about. So Hollywood game plan right here. I was going to say that looks familiar to me because I had a meeting with Tiffany Smith on OIE over at CBS and she gave me a gift bag and that book was in the gift bag. That's amazing. I love that. Um, next, another mentor of mine is Mary Lou Belli and she wrote this Directors Tell the Story um, with her friend Bethany Rooney, who I also know, who is a wonderful, um, super prolific director as well. Um, so any directors, writer directors out there, this is the book that helps you figure out like, how do you direct if you don't actually understand a lot of like the technical side of directing, which was me. So I love this. And then this helped me figure out how to write a pilot in the best way possible, The Hero Succeeds um, by Cam Miller so good so those are those are my my goods um nice. my bad okay so you actually everyone said the bads that i thought of but i thought of one more which is um overusing names in dialogue don't what do, do you mean by that dialogue. elaine elaine yeah, what yeah. do you mean by that <laughs> so I, that is a mark of a green writer um, so just be careful if you find yourself using names a lot on the page. It's probably not not a good thing. And then a good note, Elaine. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome, Corey. You're welcome. That's the other one. 
the double, the double line, you know, where you say it over. And then, um, <laughs> and then my shameless, I think, well, first of all, I concur with Giselle that like, we're living in a really weird time right now. And it's okay if you can't write or don't want to. And I know, I know like the purpose of this is to help, right? But we also have to like take care of ourselves and, and say like, maybe, maybe it's just not happening right now. So when I can't write, like I couldn't this whole week, um, I've been watching the Michael Jordan documentary um, it is so good and I don't like sports so go figure um, but my fiance started watching it and I was like let me watch it too and it is just fantastic only four episodes have come out so far and I think there's 10 but I'm gonna be watching all of them nice nice awesome those are all fantastic answers um, I want to say thank you guys for being a part of this uh, I'm so grateful to to spend some time with you guys, to have you share your wisdom, not only with the audience, but with me as well. I always come out of this thing being hopefully a little bit smarter. Hopefully it sinks into me a little bit and maybe I'll be a better writer too. So thank you very much for that. Um, on our way out the door, is there anything you guys want to plug? Anything that's getting ready to, to come online or, or air on television or come to, well, it's not, nothing's coming to a theater these days. Uh, but anything you guys want to plug? Anything you're doing as we, as we finish up here? I'll take the first plug. Um, so I had a series that recently came out. It's called Doxed, D-O-X-X-E-D, about an Asian American woman who um, makes a kind of racist joke online that goes viral and having to deal with that. So you can find that at docs-series.com. Um, and also, of course, please watch Gossip Girl on HBO Max when it comes out. I don't know when that will be. And I'll give a little spoiler of me um, I just got a new job in a new writer's room. Um, mm. I'm not going to say what it is yet because my manager told me until you're on set with the breakfast burrito, you don't really have the job. So I'll wait, but hopefully please follow me and all that type of stuff. And you'll see when I announce it in a couple of weeks, when we, we actually start the writer's room and come back. Congratulations, Elaine. That's amazing. Who else? Who else? Um, I guess I, I have some stuff coming out as an actor. I acted in uh, two films that are should be coming out uh, later this year. So follow me on social media at Nick Novicki. I wrote uh, a script that made the, the disability list of the blacklist last year. So I'm hoping to still kind of get that out there. And then I, I had mentioned the Easter Sales Disability Film Challenge, which I run. And we had to postpone that because of the coronavirus, but people could still register and you could, you know, get involved and right there, boom, Corey, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so if you go to disabilityfilmchallenge.com, you can learn about it. We have uh, promo codes, email, um, watch the films. Honestly, that's the biggest plug. On the YouTube channel, we have 200 films. A lot of, you know, everyone has great stories with people with disabilities. Watch those. Go to YouTube uh, and just Google, type in Easter Sales Disability Film Challenge. Thanks, Nick. Watch, watch Corey's films. <laughs> Giselle, you got anything? Um, well, you guys can watch uh, Chronicle on Netflix if you want, and uh, that'll help me get some residual checks. But um, right now, I am picking out a few projects, uh, pitching them. So I don't have anything yet, but if you follow me on Twitter, the Solid Jam, um, I answer questions for writers, uh, I post things, so, uh, and you can always uh, send me a message or ask me a question and, and I usually try to answer if I have the time. Awesome. And John, what about you? Anything to pitch? Yeah, I actually have a show that's on right now um, that is being made during all of this, partly because of this, that Second City is involved with. On this, it's on the streaming channel Topic, which I know is not a huge name that they're very new, um, but they're starting to get into the comedy world. Um, Maria Bamford has a show in there. It's a lot of people from IFC uh, that are now over there. Um, but this is a show called The Last Show Left on Earth. And it's a weekly sketch comedy show um, that we are producing and making from our homes. It's not as low rent as it sounds though. Like we get things delivered to us, cameras delivered to us. And we have been finding creative workarounds with doing it from home. We've done three episodes so far. They come out every Thursday um, at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. 
And each one is all new material. We make it over the course of a week. We have a host and a musical guest. Um, this week we have um, Mary Beth Monroe, um, very funny um, actor hosting. And uh, Andrew Bird is our music guest this week. Uh, it's a really fun show. I really recommend it. So you can watch that. It Topic is a pay channel, but right now they're putting the episodes on their YouTube page. Um, nice. So you can watch them there. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank all of you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time and your knowledge. Um, I want to also say thank you to David Radcliffe, uh, Avi Gilbert, and Sydney Blank over at Fourth Wall Management, Jessica Orsic from Focus on Ability, the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge, and David Zimmerman from Performing Arts Studio West. And as always, thank you very much to our ALS interpreter, Mona Jean. Woo! Thank you, Mona. Um, all right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a great weekend and uh, have fun writing. Cheers. <laughs>